Welcome back to Base Bible. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia, alleluia. Just a couple weeks into Paschal Tide, and we have seen how the resurrection of Jesus has reu reunified humanity, changed our entire experience of time, and how now we as the church are to be led by Jesus, our Good Shepherd. Our overall short lesson for the season of Paschal Tide has been. In Paschal Tide, the body of Christ grows in utero, kicking relentlessly with joy, awaiting its first breath. When we celebrated Good Shepherd Sunday last week, we read in the Gospel of John that Jesus has sheep of another fold, and that he has to bring them in as well. Well, in some ways, this passage kind of anticipates the theme of this week, which is Christ's own desire as our Good Shepherd to increase the flock, and not just by lambs getting busy with one another. Now, I can tell you that as someone who is part of a mainline denomination, it sometimes saddens me that we don't have a greater culture around evangelism that is actually sharing Jesus with our family members, our co-workers, and our friends. And sometimes, you know, we get these well-intentioned lines about uh, we don't want to offend people, the church has done a lot of harm, or my personal favorite, we need to listen. Okay, now all these sound really nice and pious, but the truth is that if something is really, really good, it makes no sense to not want to share it with others, does it? I remember years ago when Game of Thrones was a huge thing and my friends were all into it and they said, oh, Caleb, you gotta check out Game of Thrones, the storyline, the action, like you gotta check out Game of Thrones. And that was just for HBO soft porn. Here, we are talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ and how good Jesus has been to us and how good we want him to be for others, okay? So, it just saddens me that we don't often share Jesus more because um, imagine if every Christian took that stance of not sharing Jesus with others. The diversity of the church would be greatly diminished if the gospel never left Jerusalem. If it never went to the British Isles, we would never get those angelic Christmas hymns. If African Americans never heard the gospel, we would not get beautiful black preaching. If the land of Rus never adopted Christianity as its official religion, we would never get the novels of Fyodor Dostoevsky or Leo Tolstoy. But even more than just the enrichment of the church by sharing Jesus with other cultures, we could also see that the primary mode of evangelism should be love. It's not to prove how right we are. It's not to increase our numbers or social status. It's simply Jesus, our good shepherd, has been so good to me. And I want him to be so good to you too. I want you to experience his love. Who is the first non-Jewish convert to the Christian faith after the resurrection? Well, lots of commentators would point to a figure named Cornelius, who appears much later in the Acts of the Apostles. But what black biblical scholars like Clarice J. Martin in her chapter on the Acts of the Apostles in the second volume of the series Searching the Scriptures of Feminist Commentary, what Martin points out is that if someone is from Africa, they're not Jewish, right? So what often happens is that we skip over the Ethiopian eunuch and get to Cornelius, when truly the first non-Jewish convert to the Christian faith after Christ's resurrection is as black as you can get. The Ethiopian eunuch's ethnographic identity qualifies him to symbolize the universal scope and outreach of the Christian gospel as inclusive of ethnically diverse persons from all nations. 
His conversion uniquely represents the fulfillment of the prophecy that Ethiopia would stretch out her hands to God. Psalm 68 verse 31. The Ethiopian's conversion, qua eunuch, fulfills the hope of Isaiah chapter 56 verses 3 to 7, which heralds a day when eunuchs and foreigners would receive full class membership in the assembly of God. Now, in our North American pluralistic societies, we put a great deal of value upon diversity. But in the ancient world, it wasn't quite so, because for them, diversity was not enrichment, it was actually dilution of a culture. So for instance, our first century historian, our friend Josephus, tells us that often people like the Ethiopian eunuch that are traveling to Jerusalem in order to worship at the temple would actually be barred from this worship. They would not be allowed to go into the temple. They didn't want Gentiles uh, to kind of dilute Jewish culture and Jewish ways of living. So there, there's not, it's not a focus on enrichment, it's actually a great deal of exclusion that the Ethiopian eunuch would have felt. He would have gone there to worship, but because he wasn't of the right culture, and especially because he was a eunuch, and therefore was kind of a an effeminate man, that, that he was going to be barred from worshiping God. In fact, eunuchs were so discriminated against that I, I feel many that identify today as transgender could, could empathize a lot with the eunuch struggle. For instance, we have a second century Syrian satirist named Lucian of so Somo Sa Somosta, my goodness, I'm going to have trouble pronouncing that one. He has a set of essays about eunuchs. And in this set of essays about eunuchs, he says something that I feel that we often hear about transgender people today. He says that a eunuch was neither man nor woman, but something composite, hybrid, and monstrous, alien to human nature. So when the eunuch then asks Philip, look, here is water, what is to prevent me from being baptized? It's not an offhanded comment of like, what's to prevent me from being baptized? Nothing, obviously. It's more of, okay, there's the water, and I would like to get baptized, but what, what might stop me this time? How will I be barred from it this time? And what God has done in arranging this meeting with Philip to answer the Ethiopian eunuch's yearning. Clearly, the Ethiopian eunuch is faithful. He's traveling long distances to go worship God. He is studying the scriptures. He is asking for help in understanding the scriptures. And clearly, his heart is toward God. So God has arranged this opportunity for him to meet Philip, specifically so that Philip would be able to baptize him in the name of Jesus, and then the Ethiopian eunuch be able to go back to his home country and to tell the queen, Candace, about Jesus, the Messiah. And this would be the birth of the Ethiopian church, an indigenous African expression of the Christian faith. It is absolutely a beautiful, beautiful story, and it is done with the purpose of bringing an entire nation to Jesus. In Paschal Tide, our lesson then in Philip is to follow God's own arrangement to bringing people into his kingdom of any of those that desire and seek after him. You might remember our psalm from when we covered it in the second week of Lent, in which we saw how it was a response to the promises made to Abraham that he would become a father to many nations. Well, so here too, it's a fitting response to the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, who is himself a fulfillment of this same promise to Abraham. The eunuch 
would have had this amazing story to tell about how initially he had just gone to Jerusalem to worship, and instead of just getting one more celebration in which he can only kind of see over the wall in, actually got to learn about the Messiah himself. Wow, he has a story to tell. And when trying to share the story of Jesus' salvation with others, it can be very difficult if we don't have a story to tell. Well, a biblical scholar at Duke Divinity School, uh, Alan Davis, has pointed out something in this psalm that I think is actually very helpful for us to discover as we try to learn about how we are to share our story. She points out that the psalmist is speaking to an ever-increasing audience of people. Okay, so in verse 25, it's a small group of the great congregation and those who fear God. Then in verse 26, it goes a little bit further to the poor. Then in verses 27 to 28, it's all the ends of the earth, all the nations. Okay, then in verse 29, it's those who have died. And then in verses 30 to 31, it's those that haven't even been born yet. Okay, so there's an ever-increasing audience that the psalmist is proclaiming to. And I think this could actually be a very helpful perspective for us as we seek to share testimony about what Jesus has done for us. That, that we can start small. That we don't have to start by proclaiming to a random person on a street corner. We can start with just yourself. Try writing down your testimony or saying it to yourself about what God has done for you. Then maybe share it with some of those in your church or in your, in your parish or in a small group. Then maybe just try one friend and, and become more comfortable sharing your story with ever-increasing circles. Like the Ethiopian, who obviously had this amazing testimony about God's salvation to share. Let's get one thing straight. Yes, God is love, but love isn't God. I remember as a child thinking that this equivalency was undeniable, thinking, well, if God is love, then, then love is God. Like, that's just how the word is works. It's, it's an exact equation. But now as I've grown, I've seen that not only is this bad grammatically, but it is theologically devastating. Let's dig into the finer point of Greek grammar here first. So, in the Greek, we have hotheos agape estin, right? So you have a noun with a definite article, hotheos, the God or, or you know, God with, with the definite article. Then you have a predicate noun, agape, which is meant to define the, the previous noun. And then you have the verb estin. Now, uh, in order to get an exact equivalency, you would also need a definite article for the predicate noun. That means that agape would also have to have a definite article, but it doesn't. Meaning that agape here is not uh, an abstract object that we can equate with being God, but is rather a quality of God. Grammatically, let's bring it down to earth here. It kind of works like this. Let's say you're enjoying a new Tim Hortons donut, uh, one of their fantasy donuts, let's say uh, banana cream pie, right? You get a banana cream pie donut and you say, oh, this donut is the best. Do you really mean that the best, like the best ever, like the best best is the banana cream pie donut? By the way, Tim Hortons, if you take that idea, I'm coming after you with a lawyer. So, but, but you don't mean that the best is a banana cream pie donut. What you mean is a banana cream pie donut has the quality of being the best. Well, so here too, it's not that we can 
have an abstract idea of what love is, and then identify that with God and say, okay, there, there's the equation. It's rather that God is uh, loving and that our ultimate definition of what love is, is constituted by God first. Okay, so aside from the complicated Greek grammar here, Caleb, why are you getting into such depth about this? It's a passage about love, you know, back off. It's a, it's a nice passage about love. Why dig into all this? And the reason is, is that theologically, the equation of whatever idea that we have about love is with God can be absolutely devastating. It's amazing to me, even in my own life, that I still fall for the idea of uh, love given how sentimental it has become, but also for a lot of people how their notions of love are indistinguishable from abuse and manipulation, right? What's it's important not to do is to have some pre-idea of what love is and then say that is God, because then you will be worshiping an idol. You will be worshiping a false God that will be out to get you, right? Um, one of my favorite rappers, well, he's not retired, but one of his, one of my favorite rappers, Joe Budden, of his of his album No Love Lost, he raps, "So God, I love love till it resented me, and if it's still a stranger, then I love who it pretends to be. I love who it pretends to be. I am giving myself over to whatever idea of love I have is. But the problem is that that could end up in self hatred if you don't think." that love loves you back, right? When for 1 John, the entirety of how we define love is by Jesus' act on the cross. You want to know what love is, it is God willing to, to die for you. That is what love is. It's not marriage, it's not sentimental feelings, it's not any of this stuff. It is God's act on the cross for you. Now, our friend St. Augustine, the author of the famous Confessions, he has a sermon about this passage from 1 John in which he ties this whole theme about God's love for us back into our theme of evangelism for this week. If God is love, it follows that the more companions and partners in the faith whom we see being born the more effusive will be the love in which we rejoice, since it is the possession of this love which is being set before us. In other words, for St. Augustine, the more that you love God, the more you will want to see others filled with that love of God. Aside from the uh, metaphorical whiplash that you've just gotten of going from Jesus as our shepherd to Jesus as the vine, uh, chapter 15 of the Gospel of John uh, serves a very important purpose in these next couple weeks. For it is part of a set of three discourses and a lengthy prayer at the end of the Gospel of John that are often called the Farewell Discourses, which is sort of the uh, last testament Jesus gives to his disciples before he goes to the cross. And in some sense, these Farewell Discourses are appropriate to read now during the season of the Resurrection, because when Jesus gave this last testimony, he is telling his disciples, this is what I promise you after I've gone to the Father. This is what's going to happen after my death, resurrection, and then ascension, which we are anticipating in just a couple weeks. So we are now looking retrospectively at what Jesus promised before he went to the cross. So we've mentioned before in previous episodes that the Gospel of John is thick very thick with scriptural references. So there are many directions that we could honestly go with this text. It's very, very dense. Um, but the thing that I want us to focus on really is the last verse, that you may bear fruit and become my disciples. Now, while in other places in the New Testament, fruit refers to good works 
or to virtues, especially the fruits of the Spirit uh, in St. Paul the Apostle. For the Gospel of John, fruit specifically refers to spiritual progeny. We can see this specifically earlier in the Gospel of John in the incident where Jesus meets the, the Samaritan woman at the well. After Jesus has brought this woman to faith in him as the Messiah, he explains to his disciples, listen, the harvest is ripe, you know, the harvest is ripe, but the reapers are few. And just look around and see how ripe they are for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit. For eternal life. He's already gathering disciples and spiritual progeny. So what Jesus is, is trying to show his disciples here is that as they continue the mission that he's given them, as they continue to abide and depend on him, that they themselves will bear fruit. They will produce more disciples. And it is in producing disciples that they themselves, shockingly, become disciples. In fact, evangelism is one of the key traits of becoming a disciple of Jesus. It is by doing so that you actually become more of a disciple of Jesus yourself. So in Paschal Tide, as we see that Jesus desires to increase his flock, to bear spiritual fruit in the world, we can see that to evangelize is to become a disciple ourselves. Now, I want to close this week with uh, an ancient Latin Christian poem that unfortunately is actually anonymous. It's been attributed to various people. We don't actually know who wrote it. And it is called the Dilingo Crucis, or the Tree of the Cross. And it's a very beautiful long poem that we're only going to read a part of here. But it illustrates for us this beauty of looking at Christ as the vine through which the entire church grows and develops into fruit. So I'm going to read this uh, section of the poem for us. There is a place we believe at the center of the world called Golgotha by the Jews in their native tongue. Here was planted a tree cut from a barren stump. This tree, I remember hearing, produced wholesome fruits, but it did not bear these fruits for those who had settled there. It was foreigners who picked these lovely fruits. This is what the tree looked like. It rose from a single stem, and then it extended its arms into two branches. Just like the heavy yardums on which billowing sails are stretched, or like the yoke beneath which two oxen are put to the plow. The shoot that sprung from the first ripe seed germinated in the earth, and then miraculously, on the third day, it produced a branch once more, terrifying to the earth and to those above, but rich in life-giving fruit. But over the next 40 days, it increased in strength, growing into a huge tree which touched the heavens with its topmost branches, and then hid its sacred head on high. In the meantime, it produced 12 branches of enormous weight and stretched forth, spreading them over the whole world. They were to bring nourishment and eternal life to all, the nations, and to teach them that death can die. Well, that is us here for this week at Base Bible. Thank you so much again for watching. Our overall short lesson for the season of Paschal Tide has been... In Paschal Tide, the body of Christ grows in utero, kicking relentlessly with joy, awaiting its first breath. And this week we've seen how Christ as our Good Shepherd has desired to increase his flock and to bring more spiritual fruit, progeny in the world, in the following ways. That we are to follow God's arrangement to bring into his kingdom any and all who seek him to develop and share our testimony of what he has done for us. To love others is to bring them to know the love of Christ our shepherd. And then by evangelizing others, we become disciples ourselves. Thanks again for watching this week. We really appreciate it. Please like, share, subscribe. Uh, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, 
And if you really do enjoy this work and you want to see it continue, please consider becoming a Patreon subscriber and giving financial support for this to continue going. Thank you so much. Again, we will see you here again next week for the sixth week of Paschal Tide. Blessings to you.